Hi, I'm Kristen Poole, the Artistic Director of the Foster Museum, and I'm here again with Tony Foster to talk about sacred places. Um, today's conversation is about Cabazon Peak, which is a part of a volcanic yeah. field. I was reading about the history of, of the peak itself, and um, it's now, I guess, on Bureau of Land Management land, which is a, a government designation for, for a land designation. Um, but it was a there was a ghost town near there, and prior to that, it, it, this was a, a, a trading stop up until the 1940s. But it doesn't oh. sound like there's very much there now, huh? <laughs> no, nothing that I noticed certainly. How did you hear about it? What? Why did you make a choice to go to the Cabazon? Um, because it's very important to the Pueblo people and to the uh, and to the Dine uh, or Navajo, and um, nobody told me. You know where was a good view of it, uh, and I found it quite actually quite difficult to find a view that really worked for the bigger painting. The, the smaller one um, I managed to do without too much trouble, uh, but the big one, big one, I had to really hunt around to find exactly the right spot to to paint it. It, it can look quite dull from quite a lot of lot quite a lot of quite a lot of views of it are quite dull. I found. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. So did you were you did you go there with anybody or were you by yourself went on this particular journey? No, I was by myself uh, both oh. times. In fact. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was reading about the Dine's um, relationship to this particular peak. And as I understand, there's a legend. Um, I guess Cabazon means um, cabeza obviously is head in Spanish, and cabezón means big head. And mm. that the the Dine myth um, or story that is um, built up around Cabezón Peak is about a, a giant that has been slain, and um, that then all of the the lava that extends out is his or her congealed blood. Yes, uh, I think that's supposed to be right. Yeah, yeah. I love that's those. Funny. Story. There are several of these of these volcanic plugs in that area, but this is the most uh, prominent. So you talked about um, the fact that that you had some t difficulty finding uh, the spot for this particular for the big painting of Cabazon Peak. I, I, there, <laughs> this painting when you look at it so closely it's really amazing the sky because it looks as if either the volcanic vent is sort of pushing the sky out or or pulling the sky into it did you have to wait very long for that sky to occur i mean it's really quite incredible you couldn't have asked me a better question actually because i was looking at my diary um for that time and um uh can i can i read it out to you please you? yeah it says um uh, I found a BLM dirt road along the edge of an escarpment overlooking the peak. Although I never felt less like anything in my life, I set up my three-foot drawing board and was about to start work when three rifle shots rang out. I didn't hear the first bullet, but the second was closer and I could hear the third parting my hair as it whizzed by. Not knowing what else to do and assuming that no reasonable person would want to shoot an artist, the most harmless of beings, I carried on drawing. Not very complicated, just the bottom third of the paper. Started trying to invent an started trying to invent an exciting sky. Rather laboured, but at 5.30 looked up and exactly the sky I had in mind presented itself. So I adapted mine to fit. Rather a mess at present, but I think I can bring it round. Packed up at seven as dusk was falling and drove the back road, which seemed absolutely interminable, to Cuba. I wasn't. I wasn't going to um, stay in a motel that night. In fact, I'd gone uh, with all my camping gear, assuming I would camp. But after I'd been shot at, I thought I perhaps wouldn't stick around. <laughs> all... <laughs> yeah, good idea. So, <laughs> did you ever figure out who? And do you think they, in fact, were shooting at you? Oh, they were certainly shooting, shooting to frighten me because it was so close that it couldn't possibly have been a coincidence. Um, but, but as I say, I thought, I thought, well. Whoever it was, if he wanted to kill me, he probably could have. So I guess it was just to, it was just to give me a fright. 
which is which he did do. <laughs> well, yeah, and I don't even imagine how you then settle down to paint after that. I mean, yeah. what did you do? Did you like do some meditation mantra or walk around or scream and yell or uh, what would you? I've, I've often, I'd, I'd often before that, I'd often wondered what I would do if I encountered that kind of thing. Uh, and and now I know. I just thought, oh, yeah. Uh, I sort of ducked when I heard the bullets <laughs> whizzing past. And then I thought, well, I expect if he wanted to hit me, he would have. Uh, and assuming it was a man, it could have been a woman for all right, I know. For sure. uh, um, and it was a rifle shot, certainly. So I had no idea where it come from. Um, and and I just carried, I just got on with my drawing. Wow, amazing! <laughs> Make yourself slightly smaller, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we shrink a bit for a while. That's a bit. <laughs> well, that explains the um, bullet casing that is a part of the souvenir. Yes, there are three bullet cases. There are also, if you look, there are three bullet holes in the painting. Um, uh, which oh, is, I see uh, them now. I had never yeah, seen them. Not really before. bullet holes, of course, but I, I just poke my pencil through the painting to to remind me of. <laughs> Three bullets, three oh, shots. Tony, I, I never knew that. That's so interesting. <laughs> That's so great. Well, again, I'm I I I'm so astonished by your ease with which you pull us into the painting and all the detail and that foregrounded rock and the great green of the. I guess are are they pinions at that? I don't know if they're pinion trees or not. I think um, they are pinions. Yeah. Yeah, and then you you take us into that beautiful, beautiful landscape, and the sky is really tr quite tremendous. And it then tremendous, the, the other, I, go ahead. I mean, one of the one of those things where I thought, you know, I it's it's one of those things which sometimes happens where you have evidence that you are in the right place at the right time. You know, you 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 settle to think, wow, well, th this sky was created just so that I could make this painting more interesting. Because if you look actually at at it. The landscape itself is only the bottom third of the painting. Right. And actually, it's not that exciting. Uh, the peak itself is not that exciting a, a motif, really. But but once I got that sky, I mean, that was just absolutely the key to the key to the painting. Another yeah, thing that, all yeah, the energy. Yeah. Uh, another thing about it which always puzzled me and I've never solved is those that strange collection of rocks in the in the foreground, sort of, yeah. sort of almost like rock pillars, really. Yeah. Um, which should have been lying flat. I mean, the one, the the, the on the left hand side of the painting, the, the um, you know, it's just a, a flat piece of, of right. sedimentary rock. Uh, it's exactly the same rock, but for some reason, these ones have ended up almost okay. like a sort of mini explosion. And yeah. And, um, you know, if you were to draw a cartoon of an explosion, it would look like that. Um, and and I've never I never managed to puzzle out why they'd ended up looking like that. It looked to me like somebody had been, you know, somebody had come and thought they'd be useful, you know, as useful slabs of rock. And so they kind of prized them out of the ground and then just left, left them. them. Huh. Yeah. Because they were just piled one on top of the other. Well, so I I love how the angle of those rocks mimics the angle of the of the Cabazon Peak and the the motion of the cloud. You yeah, know, it's really quite wonderful. The whole thing fits, fits so neatly together. I think. Yeah, right. they really it's echo one each of my other. Paintings from that series, I think, because there's well, first of all, of course, because because I narrowly avoided death, but also, <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, so I shall never forget doing it. Um, but also because all the, what seemed to me at first to be a rather dull landscape turned out to have real really it's got a really dynamic feel to it that painting and and, uh, and that's why I love it so much I think it it's a it's a beauty it's a real beauty yeah. part of the souvenir is one of the Zuni fetishes that there are in a number of these paintings can you tell us again did you meet Homer I think his name Homer Atherton is yes, the name yes. of the artist who made who made the arrowhead yeah yeah, yeah i did um and and i asked him because he said he'd, he'd more or less stopped making arrowheads because his wrists had, were giving out he was he was 80 when i met him i think and, wow. um, um and i asked him if he would make some some for my paintings and he and he made a, a set of most beautiful arrowheads some of which are so beautiful i haven't I haven't couldn't bear to put them on paintings i've still got them <laughs> he made uh, i don't know um 
eight or ten, I think, for me. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. Um, and, and he said, well, those are the last ones I shall ever make because I, you know, my wrists have given out. I can't, I can't do it anymore. So I felt, oh, I felt, I felt really, very honored that he'd done that for me. Yes. Sounds like you should. And I'm sure he was happy to be a part of your paintings. You know, I love this little drawing. Um, I guess it's not a drawing. It's a painting. You really get a sense of your process. Um, you see how you frame the image, how the drawing is extended out beyond that frame. You see some of the sketches of your of your notes that you talk about the light. And then the thing that I wanted to ask you about is on the on the left hand margin, there's of course all of your color swatch marks where you're mixing colors and trying to determine. So most of these paintings you complete probably two thirds of them while you're on site. And then you go back to your studio and you complete them. Do you ever get back to your studio and think, how the heck do I marry that? How do I find that color? How do I make that color again? Do you? Well, it's, it's in a way, it's a, it's a kind of laziness on my part. I think that, um, you know, if I had any sense and wanted to keep the painting pristine, I would I would have a separate piece of paper to test all my colours out on before I apply, apply them to the painting. Um, but but because, you know, I'm sitting there, the wind's blowing, um, you know, the, my drawing board's rattling about, I'm trying to keep it still. And the last thing I need to do is have another piece of paper that is also flapping about. Right. And, so, and so I tend to, to use the margin of the paper just to test the colours out before I use them. Um, and that's, you know, that's always... I'm, I'm trying to match up what I see, really, and so I'm always trying to to get the exact exact color that I'm looking at, that I'm seeing. Um, and to do that, you have to experiment a bit. Um, and and so you know, I just do it on the margin of the paper. And sometimes I you know tear it off because I think the painting looks better without it. And sometimes I leave it on because it it, it the painter once said, you know, a good painting should demonstrate the means of its making. And I. Mm. And I what that means is that, you know, people actually like to be able to kind of untangle how you end up producing an image. Uh, and, and this really is, is my guideline on, you know, how I, how I find the colors I need for, to make the painting. Um, and so, yeah, so it, it and, and I say it's, it's partly, partly just convenience on my part that, that it's one less thing to have to think about than, than yeah. other people. Um, but also, um, in some ways, it's quite nice to, to kind of demonstrate the fact that these things are handmade. Well, I think that's for me, that's what's so wonderful about drawings in general is you really get a sense of the mm. artist's hand. And it's, it reminds you that this isn't, you know, something that's just appeared on a museum wall out of nowhere, but that there's actually a person and a process and, uh, you know, a, a, a considered um, hand behind it. And I, I like that very much. So yeah. also I noticed that it looks like when you look at these two pieces that you did of Cabazon side by side, mm -hmm. they're not the same view. No, um, no they are. That's right. Um, and also, in fact, if you look at the date, they're 18 months apart. Um, oh, right. Was, 1, 18, 20, yes. As I was going along, I was looking, you know, seeing how the landscape was changing. And I came to this point. I thought, yeah, I bet if I walked out into the back country a little bit from here, I could, I could find a. The carries on was obviously quite a long way away at that point. Yeah. And so I thought I would just make a small sketch. I, I suppose I was just trying to take a first look at carries on to make sure that that you know it could make a painting um, rather than you know plan a, a a camping trip there for three or four days and and then find it wasn't going to work. So yeah, that sure. was a sort of scoping trip really. I seem to remember that it took me three days to do the big painting. Um, to, as I say, it's one of my favorite paintings, that big one. It's a beauty. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Uh, quite right. You're very welcome. Thanks, Tony. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.